Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. On today's show, we have Greg Galuccio. He is a veteran in the lighting business. We're going to talk to him all about his experience at UL, Leviton, Max Light, and now his own consulting firm. Yeah, it'd be fun. You know how we do these things, sucker. But you know what? Before we go there, we got to talk about the craziest people in lighting, Greg, TCPI.com. What do they got? Well, they have a new one. This is even crazy. TCP Color Flip Ooh. provides two colors in one. Now, one of the topics we're going to talk about today is smart devices and all that. This does not require a smart device. No app needed. It's a light switch. It's an on-off, flicking on, turn it off, turn it on. It changes colors for you. Two colors in one. You can either get 24K and 3K together, 27K and 4K together. These are A lamps. 27K in red or 27K in blue or 27K in green. And then yellow is coming too, so color changing. But all you do is flip the switch. Boom. And it changes uh, the whole dynamic for you. And it's dimmable. I love all color TCP. flip. I got them out on my counter right now. I got color flip sitting right on my counter. Yeah. Just the nice. people come in, they buy the color flip. Flip it, brother. Because they're the craziest people in lighting. Always coming out hot with some great stuff. Go to tcpi.com. That's right. tcpi.com. Color flip. That's a cool little product. Of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, NAILD.com. Or keep it real, get it tight, get associated, come down, join us. If you're a distributor, electrical or lighting, and you're not in this association, brother, you are missing out. We're the hottest thing since sunburn. That's right. But for right now, we got Greg Galuccio on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. What's happening, Greg Galuccio? Hey, hi, Mike and Greg. I'm in the, uh, I'm in the big leagues now. Oh, this yeah. Is cool. You made it. You finally made it. I made it. I made it to the podcast. I, yeah. I just, I love you guys. Your podcast, you really uh, have built something really interesting up here. It was just like number 180 or something like something that. Something like uh, that. Yeah. yeah. There's a ton That's of shows. There. I mean, sure. we've done so many recordings. It's, it has to be topping like 500 overall, something like that. It's up there. We've recorded That's a awesome. lot of material. Yeah, for sure. So it's, it's a blessing for us. Uh, we've enjoyed it. Day, Greg. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's been fun. And, and uh, I mean, I feel like you're in the big leagues. You've been at this for 30 years, man. That's double my time in the lighting industry. Yeah, I I started back at UL and I was there for uh, quite a number of years. And actually, um, let's see, Mike, you're a Toronto guy, right? I was in I was uh, at UL's Toronto office for three years. I lived up in Harborview, Harborfront. Mm. Yeah, uh, sure. And so I loved it there. They dragged me out of there kicking and screaming. I just mm. I, beautiful city. Um, and then I, I was at Leviton for a while, and that's where I learned about controls. Uh, I was at Leviton for 12 years, and that's when uh, legacy lighting was turning into LED. And that became a real, you know, big part of what I was doing. And then uh, from there, I went to, I went to Max Light. I was there for and what were your, a number of years. I ran, yeah. uh, I ran all their um, uh, product lines at Max Light. I was responsible for both thing and product management, the whole portfolio. And, uh, uh, boy, you, you learn a lot when you do that. Uh, so that's why I'm out now. I'm consulting. I'm working with a few companies now. It's really, uh, it's very rewarding. Yeah, I looked at your background here, electrical engineer and a master in international business. I think you covered the lighting industry pretty well there with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, uh, I actually got my master's uh, 30 years to the day after I got my bachelor's. I, I went back to school. And uh, graduated on the same the same day, thirty years later, with my my master's in international business. I spent a lot of time overseas, and uh, I I had multicultural teams in all the different companies that I worked at, and it, it's a it's a real it's what's the way I prefer to work. Cool. Now we're going to talk about your video series because I love those things. Those are awesome, by the way. But before we do, tell us about your company and what what your I know you said consulting, but what is your goal? What are you guys doing with that? Yeah, so um, my expertise is in product development and product marketing, and um, you can see uh, when you do watch my videos, you can see I have a certain sensibility about how to approach product management, how to approach portfolio um, uh, building with a certain type of perspective, and uh, I help companies who are trying to figure all this out, mostly in the commercial and industrial space. Um, to 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 navigate this market and and figure out where to go with their portfolios and and actually what kind of people to engage to um, bring in the best talent and the and the top technology as well. 
And one thing I got out of out of watching your videos again, we're going to talk about, but and, and this is something I, I truly believe in in the lighting industry, and it's even our company motto at Premier Lighting is the word practical. I feel like that's what I what you're bringing to the table is you're saying, okay, you can do all this stuff, but is it practical? Is anybody going to need it? Is anybody going to buy it? And that's what I love about your videos that you, you bring practicality to lighting. Thank you. Where it needs to um, be. You're right about about that. And and you know the the more uh, custom the lighting is, the the more spec level the lighting is, the less practicality you need to adhere to. But when you start getting down, uh, not down, but when you start getting into the levels of of commodity products and and commercial lighting and things like that, I mean, it's got to be bare bones practical. So do you feel lighting at this point is a commodity? Um, not across the board. Uh, so lighting at in A space buildings, for example, is custom um, spec grade type stuff. And you're you're talking uh, about um, buildings where uh, they spend a lot of money to create custom lighting. I, I worked with a company recently uh, that was doing work for the Metropolitan Transit Authority, the MTA in New York City, and you know Penn State is uh, Penn Penn Station is undergoing a a retrofit right now, and the the lights are very much custom. It's beautiful lighting going in there at at, at considerable expense. Um, but then when you get into um, your basic um, uh, commercial spaces and industrial spaces, I'm talking about warehouses and classrooms and things like that, where where budget is a big issue. Um, it's it's price, price, price all the way. It's commodity. And I, I would say just from breaking it down, you know, I think it, it, to me, it feels like, and Mike, you can chime in too, but I think 90% of what we sell is in that, that area. 10% is in the, you know, architectural or whatever. And, but the lighting industry, 90% of the focus is on the 10% of the sales. Is that, is that, am I crazy or is that where it's at? I think it's because lighting designers have too big of a voice. Um, and like, that I think it's like their their voice is over listened to because most projects are not lighting designers are not involved. I would say that lighting designers are involved in less than ten percent of all lighting transactions, and the vast majority of lighting is sold by contractors and uh, distributors. And so I and 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 to that commodity uh, area of lighting. And that's 90% of the sockets. If, if that's still a word sockets. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the voice of lighting designers are the loudest and the proudest and the ones that talk the most, but they sell the least by far the least amount of lighting. And so I, that's what get a grip on lighting is about is changing that conversation, adding our voice to the mix. And we've accomplished that. And I, I don't mean to pat ourselves on the back, but that's what we've done. And we've created that voice and we have brought the distributors to the table. And now they have a voice and they should because they sell 90% of everything that's sold. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. So How do you, from a manufacturer sure. side, from your experience in that, Greg, do you feel like manufacturers understand that? I know at one point they didn't. Do they understand it now? They understand it. But the problem is that being in a commodity space is a really hard place to play. Um, mm -hmm. Because if, if you've got, Number one, you've you might have seen in some of my videos that 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 all the products are the same, so everybody's on the same playing field. You, you're not only sourcing the product, the same product, but you're sourcing a product that's identical from the same source as the other guy. So, if if this one's thirty nine dollars and this one's thirty eight fifty, if he gets it, unless unless there's inventory on this one and no inventory on that one. So there's, there's two things um, that set you apart and, and they're razor thin, right? It's, do you have it? And is the price good? That's it. And, and what manufacturers uh, in that space try to do is differentiate themselves by adding features to the product or try or adding some kind of an aesthetic improvement like that. And the problem is that often fails. And the reason it fails is one of two reasons. Either it costs more to add that improvement. The way they ask the question to their markets is, wouldn't it be great if we had a fixture that had this improvement? The answer is always going to be yes. What they don't ask right. is, would you pay for it? Right. And so the answer to that is often going to be no. I think, I think the other angle to that is, will it be incented? 
or will the DLC pay more on a rebate for that thing as well? That's also a part of it. So the lighting industry has gotten very mixed up in the last 10 years. The number one brand in lighting is DLC. That's the number one brand. You know, that's, that's true. But however, that's regional because um, if you look at a map of where DLC incentives exist, it tends to be bunched, right? So, uh, and this is another problem that manufacturers, and that is when they go to develop their product portfolio, they go to their Northeastern sales reps and their Northwestern sales reps where the DLC is king. And they say, what do you want that fixture to be able to do? And they say, well, it's got to meet DLC premium. It's got to be all the way up here. And even if it costs an extra dollar or two, it's got to be there. And then they go down to Alabama, Florida, southern markets where energy is practically free and nobody cares about rebates and nobody cares about DLC. And their reps are telling them, no, it's got to be five cents cheaper than the cheapest one out there. And so how do you create your product portfolio, right? You don't want to have a million SKUs and have products that are intended for the southern you know, part of the of the continent and other products that are, um, you know, for the North. So it's, it's a, it's a challenge. The commodity also, you said like, but it also makes things a lot easier. I mean, you said it makes it more difficult. It makes it more difficult to differentiate yourself, but the commoditization of led lighting would be very helpful. I mean, if, if NEMA came in now, now that the technology is maturing and that arc of, uh, of uh, development is slowing and the uh, the cost seems to have kind of hit a bottom, so to speak. If they came in and were to set set like NEMA standards, like a four foot tube is 48 inches long with a medium bi pendant socket, it illuminate, puts out this much illumination and the color temperatures are this. If they were to push back on the market like that, I think it would help a lot of people. I think it would help a lot of companies. And I, I think it would help most importantly, the people that actually use the lighting, the end user customer. I think you're absolutely right. And actually, this was something that um, I, I fought for all through my career. I, I, I was fortunate enough to come from UL, which is a standardization organization. And I, I sat on NEMA committees. I sat on ANSI committees um, it, back when fluorescent um, uh, uh, lamps were. I helped standardize fluorescent lamp, uh, lamp holders and things like that. So I, 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 I know how those committees work. And I also know that the lighting is one of um, maybe not the best set of uh, players who play together nice in the sandbox that you will find. Um, the, the the big guys have figured this out, the apples and the and the and those folks, and you'll see them creating standards right now for interaction between um, uh, control devices that will help everybody because. Now you've got interchangeability, right? But lighting folks, whenever they come up with something like a really nice connector that could maybe benefit the entire industry if everybody used it, they patent it and then they try to hang on to it, not realizing that the real value is in giving it out to the market and making everybody use it because that's, that's you know, so it's kind of a myopic view and that's what keeps it, makes it difficult. So introducing a set of standards uh, Greg, to this, or to, to begin to the industry back to the way it was, GX23Q base. Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like this type of, and if you look at LED innovations, the most innovation and the most success have been in replicating those traditional shapes of lamps. The most sales have been in those areas, simply because innovation is if you have an, a completely open palette, there's almost nothing to work with. If you have rules around innovation, and this is what Jaga was trying to create as well, the Jaga Consortium. Right. If yep. you say the form factors are set, a tube is 48 inches long, the base is 24 G, 24 X, Q, whatever it is, you all of a sudden you allow p- the innovation to begin in a better way. Even the idea of a two by four panel emitting a certain amount of light focuses the innovation, focuses the mind. And I think the lighting industry can push those standards, those connectors you're talking about, get ANSI involved, NEMA involved, UL, and say, look, it's time to settle this thing down a little bit. We've been the Wild West 
for 10 years, let's start introducing some North American standards, maybe some worldwide standards with the EU, get Jaga in the room and these folks and say, look, this has to become something that can be worked with across manufacturers. Ballast, like drivers are so annoying. They have different shapes and sizes and heights and it's very difficult to repair things. And this is environmentally irresponsible, let alone a betrayal of the customer in a sense. And you know what the, the, the basic uh, stumbling block to that is, Mike, is that everybody wants to harmonize. But when you all get them in the room together, what harmonize means is you harmonize with me yeah. because I got my tooling set up for my, for my driver. And it's six inches by three inches. And if yours is six inches by four inches, I'm not going to go retool. You're going to go retool. And, that, and that's the fight that goes on in that room. And it goes on and on and on. And, mm-hmm. and what, so when does a harmonization actually work? In my experience, when harmonization works is when there's such a real need that's so obvious. And somebody comes along with a really good solution. And for... For some reason, it's able to be duplicated without infringing on anybody's IP. Um, so, for example, the USB connector, right? Um, what, what, whatever those guys did, first of all, they solved an amazing set of problems with that thing. And, and second of all, they didn't um, prosecute the IP so that only they, whoever it was that came up with that, only they could use it. And it became... You know, think think about it. in a network society. What happens is the the laws of supply and demand reverse themselves, and this is hard for people to get their minds around. In, in the normal society, you say, well, as the um, demand goes up and the supply stays the same, the price goes up, so we make more money, right? Mm-hmm. In a network society, it doesn't. What's the value of one telephone? Zero. The value of a second telephone causes the value of both phones to go up Mm -hmm. substantially. And then the value of a million telephones makes all telephones really valuable. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing for what we're talking about. You know, if my device that I talk to and network with, for example, getting back to controls now, um, can talk to and network with another device from another company. Now my device is more valuable, but a lot of people from you know traditional sales and marketing don't think that way. A lot of CEOs don't think that way. I've had to really you know rub heads with some people trying to get them to understand. No, we're not going to patent this because patenting it will kill us. Hmm. Um, so it's tough. Yeah, I think, and this kind of ties into some of your videos here. One of them you had was on well, patent minefields. Oh yeah, two two sections of that. So. Uh, dive into that a little bit. I, I mean, I know it'd be better to listen to it. I guarantee you, it's gonna, it's entertaining, great to listen to. But if you can kind of sum it up for us, we're too, gonna list. We're gonna have his YouTube channel. If you listen to this, Greg Galuccio's YouTube channel will be on the site, so you can go there and check out his videos. They're really hot. I like them myself, so I'm pretty sure if you're a cat like me, you'll enjoy them. Go ahead though and answer Greg's question, Greg G. Sure. Um. So, so the question is, you know, the patent minefield is what we all call it. And I think it exists um, in the United States for virtually every. I think in lighting, it's particularly egregious. Um, I am in favor of the patent legal patent system here. I would never advise, or I would never uh, take anyone's patent and infringe on it deliberately, or or, or anything like that. But um, it's gotten a little bit out of control. I mean. When you're when you're patenting things like phase control dimming, phase control has been around since 1920. Uh, how is it that somebody can come in and say, "Well, yeah, they were using phase control on this, that, and the other thing, but it's a novel idea to use it on a light." Uh, it's not a novel idea at all. Any engineer would figure that out. But yet they got it granted because there's pressure on the patent office to get that. Uh, so, so one, so problem number one is they're they're patenting things that really are um, not teachable. They're common knowledge. Um, a problem is that um, there you, there are people who have patents under their control 
uh, that they had nothing to do with, and they just go out and buy patents. And now you've got an entire huge portfolio of intellectual property that governs the entire industry. And no matter what anybody tries to make, um, this entity can come after them and sue them. Now, are they are they adding to the intellectual uh, capacity of the United States industrial machine? No, they're not. Are they being creative? No, they're not. Are they producing anything? No, they're not. They're just coming in and exercising their right to control over this thing, even though it had nothing to do with creating it. They're um, patent and trolls. And that's gotten out of hand. Patent trolls. patent trolls. They call right, them so, trolls for that reason. So okay? I have a U.S. And, and patent. I have a U.S. patent. Okay. And I went through the whole process, the, the ex, pre, whatever you call pre-existing art or whatever you go through and they come and they, they do all this stuff and everything else. But I sold thousands of my invention, thousands and thousands of my invention. And I still sell them all the time, every day. Um, I sell it, sell it, sell it all the time. But most inventions are not sold. Most patents, nobody, they, and in fact, many people make patents just to entrap other companies. And to trip right. them up. And the right. purpose of it is totally uh, morally wrong. Like, the, like it, there is a, there's not a legal problem with patent trolls, but there is a moral issue with them. It's morally wrong to hoard technology, wait for some poor schmuck to come along and start a business, and then smash them with your patent. Like a lot of people think the iPhone took down BlackBerry. BlackBerry was taken down by patent trolls. That's who got them. And they refuse to pay patent trolls, and it costs them billions of dollars and wasted time and all this kind of thing. So, it, it, you know, this kind of this 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 um, movement in the late '90s and early 2000s towards hoarding. You saw Motorola do it, and Google started hoarding these patents, and Microsoft started hoarding these patents. And there's patent wars in the late 2000s to 2010 to grab up all this stuff. So what? What? What are you going to do with that? Nothing. You're going to go and trip people up and take out your competitors. Come on, man. This is morally and ethically wrong. The only problem with it is not legally wrong to do it. It should be. That's right. So, so, And that leads you to believe that there's something wrong with the legal system, right? I mean, something needs to be fixed here because who's paying for all this? Consumers are paying all for these it. Laws, absolutely. That's who's paying for it. It's a tax. We're, we're, it's a, know, it's, every it's, company. It's actually rent-seeking. What it is is a form of rent, oligop, oligarchic rent-seeking. You own an yeah. asset. And you and you do nothing with it, and now you want to get paid for it, do you? Come on. Right. We're, we're supposed to be protecting the consumer, but the, the consumer is paying out the nose. Any company that sells more than five to ten million dollars needs to have a team of attorneys on staff full time to keep the company from being sued to the point where it's going to go down. Mm -hmm. And that is what we all pay for as part of our purchase price on mm -hmm. every single product that they sell. It's disgusting. Especially in lighting. It's it disgusting. Is. It really is. Hmm. Greg? Is. And, and Greg, e, Greg E, do you want to add to that? <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I mean, that, that's that, that's all valid points. And is it ever going to get fixed on lighting? I don't see there's ever a, an end to it. It's it's Is it going to continue on to the point where the top three manufacturers, again, that, that own all the patents are going to control it and everybody's just going to say, screw this, I'm done? I don't know. But here, here, here's another you know, insidious aspect to all this. And that is the people who um being infringed upon. Maybe you have a valid patent, you know, on, on, a, on a really good technology and you believe somebody's infringing on it. The incentive is to attack the end user, the end seller, right? So, so I'm going to, I'm going to use the term Home Depot, right? If I'm making an LED chip, that uses a really um, um, high technology um, process to bake that chip and turn it into something very efficient. And then I put that into, um, I sell that to somebody who puts it on a printed wiring board and they sell it to somebody who puts it into a product and they sell that to somebody who's a distributor and the distributor sells that to Home Depot. Who gets sued? Home Depot. Why? Because um, Home Depot's sell price is $50. The LED cell price is two cents. Which one do you want to collect royalties on? So, so you go after that. So could, could Home Depot possibly know that for every product that it sells, 
whether or not there's some kind of crazy soup that was made, you know, patented to make that tiny LED chip that they don't even know is in that. No, no, but they're going to get sued. Well, I mean, yeah, the litigious nature of our society. I'm in Canada, of course, but it's getting it's getting very litigious up here as well. With the uh, you know, so, like I'll give you an example. I, I I happen to sell a customer some light bulbs. Okay, sold them some light bulbs. A light fixture in their building started on fire. I didn't sell them the light fixture, and I didn't sell them the replacement lamps that went in the light fixture. Some other Jamoat came along and put in some sample LEDs that were ballast compatible, but not 347 volt. They were 120 to 277. He put them in. There was a fire. I got sued and my insurance company paid anyway, even though I told them that I didn't sell them the fixture and I didn't sell them the lamp. They just settled it anyway. And now I have like a claim on my wrap. I'm fighting with my insurance company right now. I'm saying, what do you mean you had a claim? I told you that I didn't sell those light, those, that, that light fit, those, um, those LEDs to that person. And so, but no, no, just everybody gets sued. Home Depot gets sued. The distributor gets sued. Sue everybody yep. and we'll figure it out in court. And nobody has the time for this anyway. It's attrition. Cut them a check. This, this, uh, this, I, this has to stop. It's, it's ridiculous. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of human capital. It's a waste of human capital. Instead of solving global warming, say, okay, yep. we're wasting our time suing. It's like brats in a schoolyard fighting over toys. It's disgusting to me, Greg. I'm telling it absolutely you. Absolutely is. And, and it's a shame that there are some companies out there, and, uh, and we know who they are big companies in the lighting business who have projectors who manage a portfolio of patents that they troll. I mean, yeah, it's a sure. department. Yeah. You know, so, so <laughs> with a with a PL, just like the manufacturing side, it's terrible. Yeah. The other thing is a lot of those companies are based in other nation states as well, yeah. which is even more interesting. Right. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it, it, it could almost be a sovereignty issue in that, uh, you know, uh, in that arena when you start getting into it really deeply, but we could talk a lot about this. It's an issue I'm, pa I'm, I'm very passionate about. Um, but I'll tell you this, if you have an invention, it's almost, it's almost better not to patent it. It's the other way around. It's almost like patenting an invention is almost a bad idea now in 2021. Actually, if you can keep a secret within the walls of your organization, it is better not to patent it because um, once you get the technologies out there and, and people can look at what you did and if mm -hmm. they can find a way to convince a patent um, examiner that their little tweak, like they took out a diode or something sure. like that, yep. is, has gotten them around your patent, now you know, your patent is worthless. Yep. At, at that point. Uh, whereas, yeah. So my box is a square. Like Coca-Cola, right? You don't tell them the formula. You're better off. I made a, I made a box that's a square and one of my competitors made it in a circle. Ah, yeah. And that's what's wrong with the patent office right now because like, they'll what? patent anything. Like you did, he just did, like he took yeah. the same thing and just made it in a circle. It's like, what? What yeah, is this about? This is a waste funny. of time. It's a wa that's waste of time, energy, funny. money. <laughs> All my patent. That's what's good about it. Yeah, all my patent is on all is like a trophy. It's a really expensive trophy I bought for myself. That's right. That's, That's right, all Mike. it is. I, I so, hear you and I feel you. I have patents too. It's the same deal. Uh, so, controls, uh, Greg. I want to talk yeah, about well, that controls yeah. video, but, but you could go you next. Dive into yeah. that. No, you I go. Wanted, you I go. want to do the the game changer one. Just okay. uh, I'm going to summarize. Oh, you like the game changer? I'm, one. I, I like okay. that one a lot. I liked I like your story. Real quick summary: You were told to come up with a game changing product. Listen to his video. He'll explain it more in that. But is there ever going to be a game changer in lighting again? Is there the, the potential of it? I know I know it's hard to say, but what, what, what possibly could it be? So, Greg, the first thing we have to do is figure out what we mean when we say game changer, right? Okay. Um, and here's why uh, it's misleading when we start throwing that term around too loosely. Um, if we go from... Uh, if we go from having uh, an, a fixed color temperature troffer to a switchable color temperature troffer, that's an interesting innovation, right? Um, and, and it definitely uh, brings us to a new level of technology that benefits us from inventory and all that kind of stuff. Is it a game changer? Absolutely not. It's not a game changer because they're out there and the game hasn't changed at all. 
Um, what, because you come out with that, you, you can't really patent that. It's just a switch. Although, discuss maybe somebody could convince somebody you could patent that. But um, whether you patent it or not, somebody's going to get around it. And the thing is that, um, yeah, you've gotten a little head start on the competition with that with that thing. And maybe you're out there two months before everybody else. But everybody else gets two months from now, and the game goes on. The only game changer we've seen in the past 10 years in lighting is the changeover from legacy lighting to LED, white light LED. That's it. And, and that con- that's a game changer because in that case, the entire bottom of the industry fell out. The people who owned the industry, General Electric, Philips, these folks who were making all the light bulbs, who had all the knowledge and the technology. And if you were smart, you didn't buy a light from somebody who didn't know what they were doing. Right. When LEDs came along, now nobody knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And, and don't forget about the capital involved, the capital yeah. invested. Come on, like yeah. billions of the capital infrastructure invested into into these distribution channels and chains, and that just got evaporated. Uh, no, vaporized yeah, is the right word. Vaporized um, completely. So that, and, that's a game changer. I uh, know a game changer. Is like, they, listen, the East Bay Funk Dunk is not a game changer. The slam dunk is the first guy to slam dunk a ball in basketball yeah. <laughs> changed right. the game of basketball. Exactly. Yep. Everything after that, the East Bay funk dunk, the Jordan dunk, it's all an iteration of the first guy who said, I'm just going to jump up and put the ball right in the net. That's how I'm yep. going to, that's yep. a game changer. The first guy who did that, he changed the game. Everybody else is an iteration of that. Simple. You got it, Mike. And, and, and Greg, to, to go back, to your question, the point that I was making in my video is that there may be another game changer that comes along. Who knows, right? Somebody might uh-huh. develop some kind of atomic light source that that is inexpensive and incredibly, you know, uh, uh, malleable, and that's the game changer, right? But what you can't do is sit in a boardroom and put up your strategy document and say, all right, engineering, you come up with a game changer and sales, you're going to sell it. And next year we're going to make a, a, you know, a killing on the market because game changers don't come along that way. Now, does that mean that you don't push innovation and you don't, um, you know, try to instill creativity in your design staff and your marketing staff and everything else? Of course not. You, 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 should always be pushing that kind of stuff. And if you're not, you're not even in the game. But that stuff is not game changer. That's forward movement of technology that takes place every day, all day long. All right. There you have it. We'll see what happens with that. Controls. Well, the that, four reasons. Really hey, the, the four. <laughs> yeah, the that's a good video, man. If you like, I let, let's just put out the four reasons right now. Just what are the four reasons? I'll let you. Okay, so so yeah, um, the f- the first reason why it's really difficult to sell controls is because the people who use the controls are not the people who specify the controls. So the end user of the controls is not are not the ones who are asking for it. As a matter of fact, when they get it, they don't often want it. Mm-hmm. So it's really difficult to sell a product that the end user doesn't want. So mm-hmm. who specifies controls? For example, you know, lighting designers, who we talked about early, they specify controls and they specify what type of control they um, Utilities, they're pushing controls because they see uh, an advantage to uh, getting, getting some efficiency out of the controls. Um, contractors who realize this is just another sell, it's an upsell I can do, and that kind of thing. Building managers, uh, the guys who want to see how much energy is actually being you know, utilized by the building, or maybe they want to do something else with the controls, put it on a schedule. or something. All of those people are the people who decide whether or not controls go into the building, but the people who use the controls, the folks who walk into the building every day and sit at the desk and underneath the light are not the ones who ask for it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's reason number one. Why, why? And and by the way, have you gone into a, a commercial building lately where most of the work that's being done is, for example, software programming or anything like that? Mm-hmm. The first staff does when they walk into that room and sit down is turn the lights off. Sure, yeah, because they're at their monitors and that's all they want to see. Mm-hmm. It's common. So so yep. 
you know, if that if that set of lights is on a schedule or is under an automatic control where they turn it off and bang, it pops on again five minutes later. Guess what's going to happen to that control system out of the wall? Yeah. So yeah. So that's and, one. It, real quick on that on that point. You know, it, it, I've always known this about myself, I think, but it just hit me and I had to write it down. It's when I sell controls, it's because a customer asks for it, you know, and that's it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't go out there and push it because they don't want it. Yeah, it, it's, totally there's an element problem. of controls, and I want to say this very delicately, Greg, where, yeah. but it's not going to sound that way, that, they're, that people <laughs> are kind of cooking up schemes for other people. You know, it's like, I know what they'll do. <laughs> It's like you don't ob- you obviously don't sell lighting to people very much actually because if you actually sold lighting to people for very much they really like light switches a lot and dimmers yes, wall do. dimmers they really they like so that a lot and they're so intuitive and and let me ask you let's let's go through an interesting scenario um, when we talk about complexity which was one of one of my four reasons um, uh, let's say that um, You've got a system that can schedule the lights in your mm-hmm. building. Mm-hmm. And um, you schedule the lights to go from full down to 50% after 7 p.m. Because you don't want your but you, there's nobody else in the building. So at 7 p.m., lights go down to 50%. Mm-hmm. Um, now, um, you know, one of the guys forgets his 8 o'clock at night. He goes back into the building. And when he walks into the room... He flicks the light switch on, the lights go to 100%. Mm-hmm. And he grabs his computer and he walks out of the room and he flicks the light switch off. Where do the lights go? Do they go back to 50% or do they go off? These are the use cases that you have to develop when you're, pr- when you're programming the software, or controlling the software, right? The problem is like the, the, the most obvious application for complex lighting controls is for outdoor street lighting. It is so obviously a good application yes. for controls, yep. okay? Outdoor yep. street lighting, dim it, change the color at night, warm it up. Um, dim it down, make sure the fixtures are dark sky friendly, all this kind of thing. You can really do a lot with outdoor controls. I think another application is in people's homes. I think people like to play funky monkey with their lights on their phones and stuff like that. They sure do. I think yep. it's something that would really fly. In a, When you're in an industrial factory or something like that, who's going to be in charge of the lighting control system now? Uh, and, and, you know, how many people are you going to train on the lighting control system? Or do you just want the rack aisles to have a sensor so that they go off yes. and on? Yes. You know, now, it's difficult I, to sell, man. It's difficult to sell. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but there were a number of companies who put a lot of money into developing controls. And most of these were, um, actually fixture companies, uh, and, some of them either went out of business or nearly went out of business. And one of the reasons is you asked the question, you know, who, who's responsible for programming those controls and making sure they do it, what everybody, it turns out it ends up being the ones who sold the controls mm-hmm. because in a, in a residential building and residential controls are actually doing really well right now. Everybody's got, you know, Amazon Alexa and everybody's got their, their screw in light bulbs that sure. talk to the yeah, system and they love it's them. Fun. And by the way, if, if it's hard to pair the thing, you're going to sit there, you know, and try to figure it out until you get it, right? Yeah, because, sure. you know, you, so in a commercial space, uh, when the lights aren't behaving well, uh, uh, first thing they phone, they say, uh, Mr. Contractor, Mr. Installer, or Mr. Manufacturer, get in your car and come over here and fix this. Yep. Job is a callback. Yep. Even if the lights are operating perfectly, every job is a callback. Yep. And the the amount of post sales dollars that you have to to maintain yourself as a lighting controls company in good standing is astronomical. The the other thing here here's a, here's another point that I'll I'll throw out there with respect to controls because a lot of those companies are POE companies, right? Power yeah. over Ethernet, and they're yeah. always talking about like, well, you don't need to have shielded cable or conduit, right? And so it saves cost. And the most obvious thing is the, re- the reason for shielded, there may be a fire reason for shielded conduit and that, but the real reason is because wires get hit and damaged all the time. Mm-hmm. It's not for mm-hmm. fire. It's because you have wires in a ceiling, the plumber hits it and cuts the cable. Now all those cables are cut. 
where the, the reason why it's in conduit is to stop it from all to keep it working. The wire is working. Yeah. It's not just for yeah. fire code reasons. And they talk about that as if they're like, ha ha, now we know how to save a ton of money <laughs> with uh, all this cable. That's a nightmare, man. If you <laughs> if you run a POE cable all through a building and it's unshielded, that stuff's going to get yanked and ripped and cut all over. Well, ever, you obviously have never stuck your head above a drop ceiling, bud. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point, Mike. I, I, you know, I I didn't even that in my whole thing. Um, actually, let's let's go back to the four reasons. So the first reason is that the end user is not the one who really wants it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Second reason, wire, wireless communication sucks. Okay. Yep. Um, you Tough. know, unpopular statement, and and of course, I'm one hundred percent you know a geek for wireless stuff. My entire house is automated. I can turn my my garage doors up and down from my iPhone. Awesome. Okay. A huge price. And um, the price is that, you know, when you walk over to that physical switch and the conduit goes to the light, you press the switch, the light goes on. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't go on, it's pretty easy to figure out what went wrong. It's either the switch, the conduit, or the light. Mm -hmm. When you're in a wireless system now and you turn this and the light doesn't go on, what's wrong? Well, you know, you might have to make a phone call and walk through a procedure with a guy for an hour and a half to find out what's wrong. Something could be wrong. In it. Um, maybe I didn't pay the subscription fee <laughs> this this month and they and they stopped me. Um, maybe the two lights just don't talk to each other right now because they've forgotten that they're supposed to be paired. Uh, all of these things are things that we can tolerate in a house. Right. Because, all right, I'll, I'll just go through the annoyance and I'll fix it and I'll have my lights back on. Or a school or a factory, this is disaster. Yeah, lighting is mission critical. So, yeah. um, like a lot of people, like lighting everywhere is mission critical. So, your Bluetooth connection to your phone so you can listen to your audio book in the car is not mission critical. It sure as hell is annoying when it doesn't work. Like, why is my phone not connecting? Oh, I got to download uh, Android Marshmallow 2.61232. <laughs> and then Chevy Suburban didn't do the new... I got to take it to the dealership because they need to update the software. Oh, you can do it by pressing the OnStar button. Okay, beep. <laughs> okay, it's now it's working the next day. I got to get you on one of my videos. Videos, man. I mean, <laughs> no, but I mean, like people like lighting is mission critical, dude. If you have yes. somebody that cannot produce their product because the lights, the Bluetooth mesh network has been disrupted somehow and now the lights are not on. Oh, OK, you're in a mall and, and the lights are not on. That's a safety issue. That's a theft issue. You got all manner of problems. Lighting is mission critical. And wireless is has all manner of little traps and potholes. And how hackable yeah, is it? Can you hack it? Do you remember that one video, Greg, where the guy was driving down the road? He had hacked the lighting system on the road, mm -hmm. and he was caught. Yeah. He had the he had the the, had the, the lights. The, no, he had the lights flicking off and on, and he had his his computer in his car, and he was causing the flick off. And then he started driving, and he played like boot. Boo, 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 boo. And the lights were blinking to the beat of the music. It was hilarious. But and that, that was in Toronto. That was in Toronto. Or a, a, a municipality outside of Toronto where that happened. It's like, oh, man, now you have to have cyber security on your lights. Right, right. And, and you know, there's ways to mitigate the, you know, the, the unreliability of Wi-Fi. And may, maybe you go to POE, maybe you go to some other thing. And But, the, of course, there's issues with POE that we didn't even get into besides the ones that you mentioned. I'm a big fan of POE. I don't know if it's ever going to actually be viable, but um, it's got potential. But um, but let's go over Let's Let's quickly go to the third reason, and that is because it's too damn expensive. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, re the big reasons it's hard to sell lighting controls, um, and this goes back to the standardiz standardization that we were talking about before. Why is it so expensive to put a sensor node that has Bluetooth in it into a fixture? Um, and the reason is because, first of all, there's a power supply in the sensor node that runs off 120 volts. What is the point of that? It, it, it probably take is half the cost of the sensor node. Right. Mm -hmm. But you're you're and, and so you've already got a power supply for DC in the fixture, 
why are you putting another one in the sensor? And, and the reason is because in the commodity market, uh, nobody wants to spend an extra 15 cents. And the 15 cents you would need to spend is to put a 12 volt auxiliary output on your driver. Hmm. The, the bomb cost on that is almost zero. It's just, it's just one regulator chip and, and off comes 12 volts. And now your sensor and node only has to be a 12 volt device. Doesn't have to have a full power supply in it, dropping 120 down to 12 volts. Hmm. And uh, the other thing is that inventory wise, you have to carry two different units, one with the, the sensor installed on an assembly line or already installed as you brought it in from wherever you brought it from other inventory with a different part number for the one without the sensor and you know how expensive that is because you never guess right if you're the manufacturer of how many of each you should have um mm -hmm. so so that that's sort of a disaster also why not have every fixture have a 12 volt auxiliary come off the driver and have run to a connector and if somebody wants a control system, whether it be Bluetooth or just or you just take a sensor out of a box and you plug it in. Okay. No, no inventory issues, no part number skew issues and no separate power supply, all this stuff. And the reason they're not doing it is because whoever comes up with it wants to patent it and be the only ones who have it, which is dumb. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we'll see this happen fairly soon. So, and so the price of these will come down. And the other reason the price is really high is because it literally costs tens of million dollars to design, uh, program the firmware, the software, and, the har and create the hardware uh, for a good control system. And uh, the payback is just not there. So what do they do? Instead of sell sending you know, a Samsung SmartThings um, controller, node is 50 bucks. The same product is being sold into the commercial space for a thousand dollars because they have to recoup their costs. Yep. Instead of selling these a week, they're only selling 10 a week, you know, so it's, it's gotta be that expensive. And, and that's what, you know, that's reason number three. The, before we jump in on there, I'm not saying that. So there's like these, this is probably the third or fourth time in my career. I call it the, controls boom bust cycle so the first one was like in 2000 or so where you, they actually started to come out with like f f controls that you could put on fixtures that were passive infrared then they came dual technology yeah ultrasonic and passive infrared yeah now you're hot right and it's like everyone's gonna do it and then it was like a thing but there was some leftover stuff there i learned a lot about that technology actually i quite like it um, and then there yeah. was the, you know, in Cilium, the connected, right? We're going to put a USB or whatever in, or whatever that is, Cat5 cable into every fixture. And that was the second iteration of it. And now this Bluetooth one is like the third iteration of the controls boom bust cycle. And I think it's just headed for another bust, but what's going to be left over? What's the area? It's like UVC, UVC lighting. Right. There's a huge, wow, everyone's going to have UVC lighting everywhere. And it's like poof, the, the bomb goes off. But then there's like a settling and then there's permanent changes. Like most people don't want to have um, surface disinfection lights everywhere. But in a in a in a the stall of an airport bathroom, I think everybody would be on board with that. Right. So there's like certain applications that really come in there like, yeah, that's where you really need it. I say outdoor lighting, municipal outdoor lighting, street yep. lighting, highway lighting is such a no-brainer to have someone controlling that, dimming that based on wildlife, bird migrations. You could have a sign that says the lights will be dim between, you know, this date and that date for the migration of the great horned owl or whatever the hell it is. That's now really important to people. That's important. Um, and you could yeah. dim it or change the color or whatever it is that you want to do. I see that. Is there any other applications you see that are really hot and tight for this technology that would be really well, I, good? I think um, I'm not really good at predicting big trends, but but um, what I see coming is uh, in indoor space and also outdoor spaces that are simple, like, for example, parking lots and things like that. People are going to realize that the type of control systems that they need or, or will be best for that are really simple ones. Anything where the fixtures can be grouped 
easily and reliably and turned on off dimmed scheduled very, very simply. That's all you need for a parking lot. You know, the problem is that, you know, they let engineers like me design these systems, right? So, so I sit down at the drawing board with a bunch of brilliant engineers around me and we're like, what can we do with so holy put a matter transporter into this thing and it'll work you mm. know and that's what we give them all right but really what they need is something so much simpler and, and so much less involved and less expensive um that when everybody figures out that that's what's really needed and not what's being hyped that in commercial spaces you can have very simple just sets of sensors that are bluetooth and they see each other and they just plug in and they all like each other. And, you know, when somebody walks into the room, five fixtures go on and then the next five go on and they all go on. Um, that's it. That's I it. think I think I, I think I'm going to I'm going to add to what you just said. or I'm going to maybe maybe it's a pushback. I don't know. Yeah. So the number one software companies in the world, Facebook, Google, these are software companies. That's what they do. They make software. OK, so Google, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, let's throw in Baidu over in China and Alibaba and the Chinese big ones, Tencent, um, whatever else they got over there. Let, let's, those are the biggest, smartest companies in the world. So what they do is they make addicting products that ruin people's lives. That's what they spend most of their time doing. <laughs> okay. So well they, said. yeah, they, they, they make gaming casinos. They get people to bet and gamble. Like I have a theory on social media. If you want to start a, a successful social media company, take one of the seven deadly sins and get people to be able to commit it digitally over the internet <laughs> all day long. And you'll be, absolutely. No. so Twitter is rage. Facebook is envy. Instagram is vanity. Tinder is lust. Uh, YouTube is sloth. TikTok is sloth. Like that's all it is. They're just the seven deadly sins. Okay. But what is the model there? Okay. What is the model they're using? Okay. This is the problem with lighting software. The user of the software is the product, not the customer. Okay. So if you're on Facebook and you're posting your images or you're tweeting, you are the product. You are what is bought and sold by Twitter. And they make their software amazing so that they can sell your information. If the lighting industry wants to make software that's successful and that people will want to use, they have to turn those users into the product. Yeah. And if they yeah. can't do that, they're never, you're still, you're going to be stuck with disks like Microsoft sending people disks that they, you know what I'm saying? Back in the 90s, <laughs> yeah. you get a disk. Yeah. Right, yeah. the the, the yeah. software explosion, the creation of Google, and you, you search something on Google, you're the product, bud. You're not the customer. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah. like that that's that model has not even entered people's minds in the lighting business. How do we turn the person under the light into the product that we sell? That's yes. creepy as hell. And, and there's a creepy it's as hell. Absolutely true. So I, I'm with you on that. And there's a second aspect to it and that is the product um is that should have all kinds of capability maybe it has all kinds of capability built into it that's not activated it's the tesla model right mm -hmm. um you own a tesla that car can do things that you didn't pay for yet mm -hmm. can dance right car can, can dance i i mean you know if you you, you have, it does what it does, but if you want the feature where the car can, um, you know, pull out of the parking lot at the restaurant and pick you up at the front door, you got to pay another ten thousand dollars for that. It's already in the car. Sure. Not like they have to come over and do anything to the car; they just activate it. Okay. And if you start looking at lighting fixtures and lighting products and levels as uh, items that you can sell that are already prepackaged with additional services that the customers are eventually going to figure out that they want. And you just, hey, call me up. I'll, I'll turn it on for you for another $10,000 a year. And, and and that's how that goes. So there's so the the way people market um, products in, in today's technology is changing. And that takes a long time for some people to figure out. You know, we're lighting guys. We're, we're metal bands. Uh, when we see something like Tesla creating a, a product that's that's not built in obsolescence, but we're we're just going to sell you services with my vehicle, you know, it's hard to wrap your head around that. 
And the, that, it's going to take it, us a while. That's be, like lighting is actually the most interesting technology right now in the interior space because where it's headed. So we did the first live stream, Greg, in Paris over Li-Fi. Okay. So Li-Fi mm -hmm. is literally two way internet signal through the light. Okay. Yep. And we've often talked about the matrix on this show. It's, it was an early theme that kind of went away for a while, but we're kind of re-entering um, the matrix here with Greg Galluccio. Back in the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> like I think, I think if the, like the, the lighting is the information, right? So if we're able to create send signals through artificial light or electric light, internet signals, we could do it roughly right now. That Li-Fi signal that we sent from Paris, the live stream back, and everyone we're calling our friends, we're live streaming over Li-Fi. Most people weren't that excited, but we thought it was pretty cool. But that is like Alexander Graham Bell's first call to the corner, brother. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> the fact that the information is in the light, you just put that in your pipe and eat some uh, psilocybin mushrooms, or <laughs> smoke a joint, and think about that red for pill, a little blue while. pill. Exactly. You think yeah, about exactly. that for a little while. <laughs> Let me add right. to that. So, let me add to that. So, so here's another thing. When we when we create these Wi-Fi networks, or we do PoE and we, we you know connect, what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to connect all of these devices together so we can control them as a group, right? Essentially, that's what we're doing. And so messages on everything else, um, but everything's already connected together. Where by light. At the at the circuit at the circuit breaker panel, every oh, okay. single device in the building is connected to the circuit breaker panel. So why aren't we putting the brains in a circuit breaker panel? Um, you know, that's been we tried. Really be... Circuit breakers are there to prevent ah. fires. Okay, <laughs> I've had lots of guys come and tell me that they got like a magic box. Ooh, it turns off the sine wave sixty five, and then you. Really, 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 I don't like circuit. Don't go near the. Don't go near my panels, brother. But I'll tell you this. I'm going to add to that. You said that we group these vice these devices all together so we can control them. Okay. Have you ever heard of Marshall McLuhan? You know that guy. Yeah. He said yeah, the medium more. is the message. Okay. Yeah. But he also said something else. He says first we shape technology, then technology shapes us. I think yeah. we're actually grouping those controls, those things together, so they can control us. <laughs> it's actually yeah. the other way around okay yeah. and that's where we're headed like, like a Stephen king novel yeah well <laughs> it, and we're living it brother we're living it right Still now are, yes like we're living in a yeah. horror movie toronto's been <laughs> locked no i'm not kidding you toronto's been locked down for since september or something like that like, i don't live in toronto thankfully within the boundaries of toronto but that mayor is a cuckoo nut job man He's like, oh, we're never going to let you go. You're like, it's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, this stuff. We're living it right now, okay? And if you think that the end game of this is not total access with light, I believe that's what's going to happen. That all the information, you're going to have two-way transmissible light signals in, art, in electric and artificial light. On outdoor lighting, it's going to be at the same time a camera and it'll... It'll, somehow it'll know your gate so it knows who you are. It'll know as you walk through those beams of photons or whatever, it's going to be able to do facial recognition. It's going to know your heartbeat. You're not going to need any of these. So you just talk to the light just like it's a, it's like a fake God, you know? Yep. And, um, and, why, and why are the lights the first thing we think of when we talk about putting controls and sensors into the building is because the lights are the only organism inside the building that actually touch every square inch of the yep. building. Yep. Right. There's when you said you can go in a when you said electrical panel, you. when you said electrical panel, I said the light. The light is what's touching everything. It's yes. already touching yes. everything. But I, I'd like to go back to the electrical panel again for a second. Okay. Um, I'm a get out of guy, that panel. Right? Get out yeah. of that panel. <laughs> no, we're going into the panel, my friend. That's the, think about circuit breaker technology. It's a spring and a and, and a you know. A claw hammer mechanism and sure. a couple of contacts. It's the only technology that has not been upgraded since 1865, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so why? Why hasn't it been upgraded? Uh, let we'll, we'll move that away for a second, but go back to the USB connector, right? And, and think about voltage and and all the money we spend keeping ourselves from getting killed by the mains level voltage that runs through our buildings. 
right? So you've got you've got a circuit breaker, but even further down the line, now you've got wiring that has to be sized at you know at sure. eight AWG just so in case that there's a, a fault and all this current comes down the line. And then when you get to the kitchen, you got to put a ground fault circuit into. How are you spending not to get killed right now? When you look at a, a because there's voltage right there when you when you somehow touch that outlet or stick a fork in it or something there's voltage there it's going to hurt you right or mm-hmm. if wires get crossed it's going to burn the building down right how much voltage is there at a USB port I think uh, it's six you know, volt you, is it six okay volts? there's zero volts at the USB oh, port okay. because the USB port doesn't turn on until it handshakes with a device that it recognizes so I can lick it right. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you plug that into your phone, the first thing that happens is the device says, hey, are you? And the phone says, I'm a phone and I want six watts. And the device says, here's a couple of watts. Let's see what you do with it. And the phone says, here you go. And then it finally says, yeah, you really are a phone. And it and it cr- turns it on. Mm-hmm. OK, so there's a whole handshaking sequence, not for safety reasons, but so that the USB device doesn't supply power to something that's going to kill it, right? If Why can't you see? Why can't you, you have an outlet and an appliance that talk to each other? There's no reason. There's no reason. And you get fault circuit interrupters and arc fault circuit interrupters and building fires and all the things that happen. Electricity is dumbly ju- just delivered when it's asked for. We have the technology. We're not doing it. And while you're at it, put the intelligence in to be able to group things and control them. I so, think you're right about that. I, I, it's interesting. Who is the guy that now works at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Matt, is Gabe? It, uh, Gabe? Gabe. Gabe Arnold. Uh, Gabe, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah he's a good so guy. So he's talking Smart about guy. this, right? And But the yeah. problem is you can't have grid-scale electricity with DC. That's the truth. It ha- if you oh, want grid, I, I, it, it's got to be AC. Okay? So... You. The, the, like I got news for everybody listening to this. Okay, wind farms, solar power, no dice. It's going to be nuclear energy. Okay, that's already the talk. All right, all that. At the end of the day, it's going to everyone. We're going to we're going to power our society with nuclear energy. Go buy the stocks right now. I'm telling you, that's what's coming down the pipe from all these guys that that know. Ontario is fully nuclear. Okay, the whole province is like 80 percent nuclear, or 60 percent, or something like that. But so this idea of AC. Okay, we need the AC, but the idea of does do houses and homes do they need to every receptacle be AC? Not anymore, man. You can power almost everything except stoves and maybe very large appliances with with DC with DC current and get away you from know it. What? And it'd be way safer, and you'd use yep. way less energy. Look, here's the difference: if we have DC in our homes. LEDs become like a like incandescent bulbs. Yes. This is Discre- where the lighting ties in. Yeah. yeah. And, and guess what? You don't have to, you don't have to designate one outlet AC and another outlet DC. If you have an intelligent supply downstairs in your circuit breaker area, it's not going to be this anymore. It's just going to be a controller. And it's handshaking with whatever plugs into it. It decides whether or not it sends AC or DC. You know, you know what's interesting? Um the economic miracle that was Japan and Germany after the Second World War, everyone thought it was because those Germans and Japanese people, gosh, they're so efficient and smart. They're so they're just so smart. They're so smart and efficient. <laughs> Look at what they did. No, you know what got you know what got real they got real lucky. All their existing infrastructure got wiped out. Okay? Yes. And that's so right. and then and then the Americans came to Germany and Japan and said, Here's a whole bunch of money. <laughs> and they got to build yes. all this new amazing state of the art stuff. When right? you don't have an entrenched infrastructure, yes. it's easier to go to the new technology. Mm-hmm. In Indonesia, there are no landline telephones. Everybody's got cell phones, nothing else. Why? Because they didn't start actually talking on a telephone until cell phones came out. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so, so the entire country is just cell phones. We have all these landlines. What we're for? Mm-hmm. What's all that wire for? We don't need it. Yeah. Well, I like I like landlines. There's something I feel like I feel like at least they might not be listening to what I'm saying. They might not. They can, <laughs> but they might not. Greg Galuccio, we got to do it again, buddy. We got to get back. But we this need to get fun. you a better in- internet connection. You're a little bit okay. choppy here and there, but you know what? It was so good. Everyone's gonna listen to it anyway. It's one of those ones that's so hot and ready. Everyone's just gonna go ah. It's got to keep listening though. It was great. You guys are good. I, this was really fun. 
Oh, yeah, brother. You're going to be a regular. But before we leave, Greg, we got to get a little crazy, 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 (laughs) brother. There's an innovation right there, a simple one. With your light switch, Greg, what can you do with TCPI, the craziest people in lighting? Just with a light Uh, switch. Change colors. Change colors. (laughs) That's right. You go from 24K and 3K, 27K, 4K, 27K red, 27K blue, 27K green. Switch it just with a flip. It's dimmable. It's a standard light bulb that screws into a socket. Easy. Easy peasy lemon squeezy from TCPI.com. That's right, Alice and the gang. Keeping it hot and ready. And, of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Get associated. Get down where we get down and have fun and, and, and we make all the rules. That's right. We make all the rules now, Greg. The National <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I just said that on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. No, we don't make the rules, but we but we're trying to get the the people that sell light bulbs to the end users at the table. Like we were saying, to Greg, we sell ninety percent of all the lighting. We need a bigger voice. We love the lighting designers. We love you guys, but we're in charge now. And and of course, Greg Galuccio, love your videos. Uh, love the work you're doing, and what a great conversation. We probably could have talked for three hours, to be honest with you. Yep. Folks, if you Do made it, it all the way, remember, nailed's in charge. <laughs> bye, bye for now. <laughs>